couple of announcements first. Uh, if you're seeing this article, the fine print says Scientific American Extreme Physics and all these things, gravitational waves, the edge of quantum universe, string theory, the oldest uh, supermassive black holes, all of these things are pretty much smoke and mirrors in my book. If you want to see it, my book is Design versus Chaos. Um, Alan Helfenstein, where are you, Al? There he is. Bob Helfenstein's son is working to get my book on Amazon.com sometime in the fall. And it'll be available. Alan's done a tremendously beautiful job of reorganizing it, uh, um, getting a good um, index and everything for it. So that's going to be available there. And um, that's a, that, that answers all, all the things they, that are on this, in this book, this uh, Scientific American. The new model of the animal answers all those problems. The second thing is I'm wearing my uh, Great Wall <laughs> t-shirt. Uh, and it's in Chinese, of course. But my, some of you know I remarried after Tricia died three years ago. And uh, God brought a beautiful Christian Chinese woman into my life. And, uh, and I've been interested in Chinese since I was in um, school in a seminary. My great grandparents, some of you might know, my great grandparents were missionaries there in 1890. And my grandmother was born in China. <laughs> so uh, after uh, Trish and I had thought about going to China when we lived here, but her health was so bad, our, our Chinese friends, we sponsored quite a few families after Vietnam War. And uh, they said she'd never make it there with her as uh, asthma and that, that the, you know, the cities, the pollution is so bad. So anyway, uh, we, uh, uh, I call it our Great, great Wall Mission. We've r raised some money. I have to raise another $2,000 because when I originally put out my prayer letter two years ago, we, we weren't dating in that. And, uh, and she's going to go with me, of course, because <laughs> she speaks Chinese. And I don't, uh, ni hao, I know that, ni hao ma, and, uh, and I ni, pei li, that means I love pei li. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we just appreciate your prayers for that. And uh, like I say, we're going to be raising money, and if you're interested, you can send a donation to TCCSA. Just label it Chinese Great Wall Mission. Uh, we're going to be, en we ended up right now going to be going to Taiwan because southern China is in turmoil. They're persecuting the Christians there. Then we were going to go to Hong Kong, and there Hong Kong is, is rioting against the <coughs> mainland government because they want to take over Hong Kong and turn it into a communist state. So. Things are in turmoil there, but we've got a contact in Taiwan at the southern city there, Kunzhong, and uh, they want us, they're really excited about us coming and teaching a science VBS. They said, we've been thinking about this for years, and you're an answer to prayer, so <laughs> thank you, Lord. So that's, that's why I'm wearing the T-shirt here to advertise that. <laughs> then one other announcement is um, I've got this book called The Song of Solomon, God's Love Manual. How to Romance Your Wife Biblically. And it's triple R rated, romantic, romancing relationship with your wife. It's for married couples only. Because some of you know that the Song of Solomon isn't talking about gardening. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, this, I, I didn't bring, I, I brought my flash stick and asked this place to print it out, UPS. It cost me 60 bucks because <laughs> it was in color. And uh, I can usually print it out at home for about $20 on my computer. So if anyone's interested in this, talk to me afterwards. It, 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 I'm asking $15, and I'll send it to you on a PDF file through the email if you're interested in this book. So this is just a, you can browse through it in that if you're 18 or older. No, I don't use any. <laughs> There's no bad pictures or sensuous pictures, OK. Um, Amy, my, my new wife, encouraged me to write this. She, her son got married two years ago, and, and she said, Aaron wants you to teach him how to be a husband. And so I took the things that Trish and I had learned over 49 years and put them into this book. Uh, and she encouraged me. And uh, you know, we talk about Trisha all the time. And, what did I do? What did we do about things and that? And so, and some of the things in this book, I didn't learn with Tricia 
until we'd been married for 14 years. And I wish I'd known him the day we got married, you know, because I was, we were, I was 22, she was 24. I married an older woman. Uh, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's available too. So that's my advertisement about uh, different books I've got writing and working on. And, and we are going to put this, I just talked to Alan, we're going to uh, put this at the Amazon.com also eventually once we get that all figured out. There's quite a lot of engineering that goes into that. Okay, so an introduction, Curiosity, that's the m rover on uh, Mars. Uh, headline news, June 22nd, 2019. They found life on Mars. Right. The 30 seconds of news I heard on national radio said this. NASA's Curiosity rover discovered high amounts of methane in the air on Mars, indicating signs of life on the planet. And it's like, what? Methane is produced by living things. That's what they said on the, the news. After the time it was reported on the New York Times in the morning of June 22nd, I heard it at about 12 o'clock noon, and there was no mention that it could be made by geological forces. So, you know, we, we hear about fake news. There's <laughs> fake news in science, too. Now, I won't read all these, but uh, it says, you know, Curiosity rover discovered high amounts of methane in the air on Mars, indicating signs of life on the planet. T methane is typically just produced by living things. I thought, what? I found two more articles. Uh, down at the bottom, it says, as the Times noted, methane is typically produced just by living things. I says, who is reporting this? Then I found another article. This is all in one day. I was trying to hunt this thing down. And this article did say, you'll see down there, let's see if my pointer works here. Yeah. Uh, however, geothermal reactions devoid of biology can also generate methane. But I only found this in this very isolated paper. It was never reported in the New York Times. And as you know, that they set the precedent for everything else. And then this other article again says, Mars possibly indicating microbes are at work on the red planet. I mean, we've gone from methane to having, there could be life on Mars. And this is 2019. Uh, down here, it did say geological processes can account for methane on Earth and potentially on the red planet. Then this National Geographic finance is fuzzy because I shot this off the screen. They did a six one hour program. Uh, it was on Netflix, so I watched it uh, about uh, six episodes. And they try to colonize Mars in 2033, and different disasters happen, and they finally get ready to scrap it. But they, they went out, something got into one of their, their machines, and they said, well, it's blowing from up north. They go up there, and they found bacteria. And they said, we got to stay now. And the whole point of this, this uh, colonizing Mars was, we've destroyed our planet. We're going to start new on Mars, and everything will be perfect, right? <coughs> so. And this is just a reminder uh, what Bill Nye has said. He says, if you want to deny evolution and live in your world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine, but don't make your kids do it. And I said in a video, because we need them. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need engineers that can build stuff and solve problems. Well, uh, Alan's father, uh, Bob Helfenstein, helped put the Apollo 14 uh, command module together and worked with Honeywell on that. He's a creationist, and golly, he did really well. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, knowing evolution doesn't change anything. John Knuckles, some of you know uh, him, had sent me this, and he says, you can see where this is going in a totalitarian state when homeschooling or private schooling is then regarded as child abuse. And we're already hearing little things here and there that uh, because they are taught the wrong thinking, you know, they're not being taught the right way. So that's something we need to pray for and, and be aware of. So Pluto, the undiscovered country. I put D here for discoveries and UD for undiscovered. What do I mean? The undiscovered country is hidden to those whose assumptions are based on godless evolutionism, not on God and the intelligent designer creator. 
Now, how do we know if our assumptions are true? In, in science, we often have to make assumptions when we build a theory. But we always include, we, we, the assumptions are things we don't know, but we're going to include in our theory so that we can uh, get started. When they developed the Bohr model, some of you heard my talk on that, and it's in my book, they had six assumptions for the Bohr model, and Einstein was in on this. They knew three of the assumptions were wrong. They knew scientifically the assumptions were wrong, but they still included it, and it's still included in the model today. So, how do you know if your assumptions are true? By comparing them to the words of the master designer, God's word. We cannot trust our own assumptions unless they pass the test of God's word. Well, let's go to how do evolutionists know if their assumptions are true? By comparing them to the laws of science. They should not trust their own assumptions unless they pass the test of scientific verification. Four basic tests. I'm just centering on these four. There's hundreds of other formulas, but there's the laws of angular momentum, the laws, Newton's three laws of motion, there's three laws of angular momentum, the law of gravity, and the law of biogenesis. And when we apply what they're finding or what they're promoting, like this thing about life on Mars, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you that they're already thinking there's life on Pluto now, uh, uh, they have to, we have to apply these laws to see if their assumption is really true. <coughs> so, I'm going to just review a little bit of what we used to know about Pluto before the probe reached there. In 1930, Pluto was discovered by amateur astronomer Clyde Tombaugh. 85 years after the discovery of Pluto with a New Horizons flyby, we now know what it looks like. Much of the speculation based upon evolutionary assumptions for 85 years has been proven to be false. Now, of course, you won't get this in the New York Times. So here's Pluto. Uh, it has quite a few anomalies. And, and whenever I say anomaly, that's a evolutionary word to cover up that it doesn't fit evolution. Pluto rotates backwards compared to the sun. It's too high above the ecliptic. In other words, if it's spun out of this dust cloud, it should be on the approximately the same level as all the other planets. And it's 17 million miles above the ecliptic, which means it couldn't have spun out of this dust cloud. Uh, also, like I say, it spins backwards compared to the sun, and that breaks the law of angular momentum. Angular momentum law, which is a, a sub-law of Newton's three laws of motion, says that anything that spins out of this dust cloud will spin the same direction. And Pluto doesn't, as well as Venus and uh, uh, I think it's Uranus. Uh, they all spin backwards. Then the moon Charon spins at a right angle to Plu uh, uh, Pluto's ecliptic or Pluto's equator. Yeah, orbit Pluto at a right angle. So if you put your fist like this, put your hand up like this, and, and, and this is Pluto going this way, and here's the moon going this way <laughs> at a right angle to the equator because the moon cap the, the theory is that the moon broke out of this dust cloud of Pluto and then formed its own moon, okay? We'll come back to that in a little bit. So there it is going at the wrong angle. Now here's all we knew up until the horizon flyby. This was the Hubble telescope, took a picture of it. It looks like a big steel uh, billiard ball. And that's all we knew about it. This is a ground-based telescope, so that's, that's all they knew about it there. New Horizons flyover, uh, it took them nine years to get it out there. What does the undiscovered country look like up close? Here's Pluto, Charon, and four more moons they've discovered. Our moon is larger than Pluto, and we're going to look at it up close here in a few minutes. This is, uh, if you go on the internet, they do a, a, a YouTube flyover. They took all these pictures and put them together and then you can fly over and look at them. I was gonna bring that in, but it, it, there isn't enough time. So take a look at that. So introduction, a scientist reports, quote, what they found on Pluto was not at all what they expected to find. Scientists were expecting to find it heavily cratered, a flat dead world similar to our moon. 
The data sent back to Earth from the New Horizon probe has been interpreted by scientists only from an evolutionary worldview. The reason I, and most of you know the undiscovered country is from Star Trek. Uh, it may, but I'm using it to mean that much about Pluto is undiscovered because of their bias. You know, they're just saying uh, this is, was made by evolution. Much of the undiscovered country is data that shows that God did it. Now, to get us started, I've asked the, uh, one of my families here, the uh, Isaac family, to put on a little play. So they're going to come up now and uh, do a special play for us. Now, I think, let me turn this off. Check, 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 okay. Are you going to be the speaker? Who's going to be the speaker? Pardon? Oh, okay. All right. That's the Isaac players. <laughs> Isaac players. Okay. Thanks, kids. We didn't get to. Oh, where's the mask? Is it under here? Let me get it for me. I want to. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. It was a little hard to run it, but it had all special effects here. <laughs> Wow. 
I used it last summer at a, at a daily vacation Bible school that we did up at Fremont for the Chinese church there. So, great fun. So, oh, yep, thank you. All right, there we go. Can you falsify the original hypothesis? No, because they will always have another story as to why you could not find the little green man. I call it the stair-step stories. One theory doesn't work, so they build another theory to explain why the previous theory didn't work, and that's what they've done with the, the uh, model, their model, the Bohr model of the atom, and that's what they do with the whole evolutionary thing. This is the problem with so many evolutionary hypotheses. When the predictions are based on the theory, they do not come to pass. Then stories are made up to explain why the theory or hypothesis does not make a good prediction. They are only stories, and most of the times they are not based upon the scientific laws. <clears throat> so we're going to give you 10 things that we learned about Pluto that give us some evidence about what's really happening on that planet. These are called cryovolcanoes, sometimes called ice volcanoes. <clears throat> it's a type of volcano that erupts volatiles such as water, ammonia, methane, instead of molten rock. Now, these volcanoes are explained that either the planet <clears throat> or the source has a hot core, which means the object is young and not created 4.5 billion years ago. We'll show you why. Our own moon is an example. We'll come to that in a minute. Now, they claim, <clears throat> excuse me, tidal, I'm going to have to, let me do this. Tidal heating, that is the gravitational pull of a larger planet, which means the object can be any age. No, Pluto is too far from Neptune for it to pull on it to, to create tidal, you know, squeezing in that to create uh, warmth that would cause these volcanoes. If given the choice, of course, evolutionists will take the tidal heating as that goes along with their long age bias. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. This is, a, uh, is Io, Io up here which has active volcanoes on it. And, it, and so it, it shouldn't have these. A number of features have been identified as possible cryovolcanoes on Pluto, Titan, Ceres, uh, and also on Enceladus and potentially Triton. The only explanation is, in some cases, a hot core, which means the planet is young, or the moon is young. <coughs> The undiscovered country has a flowing lava lake in the heart-shaped area, which I thought was quite <laughs> ironical when they finally got this picture. It's like, and I wish God had said on there, had left the big message, I love you. <laughs> but anyway, God doesn't do that. It's up to us as Christians to show that. This Texas, here's their, their explanation. This Texas-sized basin of ice appears to be boiling. Planetary scientist Jani Rodbach likens it to a lava lake in slow motion, but is likely made of nearly frozen nitrogen, cooled until the texture is that of toothpaste. Explanation, it's, 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 it has to have a heat source, and that would be a hot core. So again, that indicates a young uh, planet. The undiscovered country has dunes. Now this is an example of the uh, White Sands National Dunes Monument in Utah, because of course we don't have a picture of it down a level. These areas here, the, the white areas, Pluto ha they go on to say, Pluto has Earth-like characteristics, a study says, CNN reported. We're still learning about the dwarf planet, including about dunes made of solid methane ice grains on the surface. Instead of craters, the dwarf planet has polygonal, polygonal shapes and features that indicate the surface is geologically active and young. And reading this, I thought, well, everything they keep saying, it's young. The surface itself is only 500,000 years old. I thought, wow, what an admission. I think the, report, the scientist caught himself when he said that and knew it wasn't politically, it was politically incorrect explanation because he goes on to say in the paragraph, he says, although the dwarf planet itself, itself is 4.5 billion years old, this activity is most likely caused by thermal convection, in other words, a hot core under the ice. 
Now, I read this whole article, and I've read others. No one has ever said in their reporting, they give no explanation from the probe as why it would be 4.5 billion years old. Everything from the probe shows it's young. So, explanation, again, it's got to have a hot core. And it's got to be young. The undiscovered country has a hot core. If Pluto were 4.5 billion years old, the core should be stone cold. I'll explain why in a minute. Again, they say it has an active uh, geology driven by heat, says one of the scientists. So it must have a molten core like our own moon. Because uh, Apollo 15, the same was found to be true on the moon. Apollo 15 put seismographs on the moon, and we found out the moon has moonquakes. It couldn't have that. The scientists said it couldn't have that if it was if its core was totally cold. This means the moon is not 4.5 billion years old. They'll never say that, you know, in the evening news. After that long, the core would be stone cold. So, we have both the moon and the Pluto having activity that indicates it has a hot core, and that hot core could not be 4.5 billion years old, that they claim. Has as an ocean underneath this crust. They go on to say there's pretty good circ circumstantial evidence that Pluto has a massive ocean in its interior, says New Horizon messenger investigator, mission investigator Alan Stern. I predict they will promote the idea that this ocean may have life in it, the little green man syndrome. You know, they just keep going further out. This is a picture here. I have had seen since the 1960s that shows life evolving out of the primordial oceans. This is the Miller, Yuri Miller experiment, 1953, and they created fake science in textbooks for the next 60 years. And this is still in textbooks in 2000, the year 2000. It has been proven to not be a good experiment, but it's still in textbooks today. This picture was based on the Miller experiment that, that I showed there. In 53, Miller experiment, it supposedly proved that life could come from a primordial ocean. The experiment, oops, sorry. The experiment is still in textbooks today to show that life can come from dead molecules. Again, this uh, activity on, the, on Pluto shows that it's young. The undiscovered country has captured anomalous moons. I love it when they, when they first found these moons, they said, well, these are anomalous. And I went through all the information to try to figure out, well, why are they calling them anomalous? And we'll compare to a couple other moons and come back to that, what I determined from it. The latest uh, on Pluto and our moons, okay? The five moons of Pluto are anomalous because they do not fit the Big Bang nebula dust cloud Theory, and I say theory, I usually just say story. Because you can say anything as story, you know. I could say, I, I could write a book and say, I stepped out the door and flapped my arms and flew over to Walmart. And he said, well, that's crazy, you can't do that. It's my story, I can say whatever I want. But is it scientific? No. Because their orbits are at a right angle to Pluto's rotation, they have not, they could not have spun off from Pluto's dust 4.5 billion years ago. The same is true of half of the 160 plus moons now in our solar system. The moon capture theory was created to explain why these moons are anomalous. In other words, do not fit the original theory, the evolutionary theory. Moon origin problems. The following shows that scientists have a problem explaining the Earth's moon and others by even the capture theory. This is a Time Life book 1991, but the story has not changed since then. Darwin's, uh, I'm sorry, the, Dar the daughter theory by Darwin's son. The moon broke off from the earth, and you can see the pictures there where, uh, I'm sorry, that went ahead, where it, it, it broke out and, was, and, and, and was part of the earth. Well, the Apollo 15, 14, and 15 trips brought back 250 pounds of rock, moon rock, and most of it is very dissimilar to the earth's crust in, in composition chemically. 
And so the daughter theory has been thrown out. The capture theory is the main one now. Objects flew into the solar system and were captured by the planet's gravity. Now we're talking about 80 to maybe 100 that were captured. Uh, and this is from the book, I've, I've summarized it here. The daughter theory, such moons apparently resulted from an evolutionary sequence, much like the one that produced the planets themselves. And, and this is from that book. But then they can't account for all of them because they spin backwards, they're too far high above the ecliptic and all those things we mentioned earlier. To complement such regular offspring, the other planets have evidently acquired some moons through capture as well, adopting orbiters that strayed into their gravitational well or fold. All right, now I'm not going to go through. I list here, and you can't read it from where you are. There are seven, if you want it, email me, I'll get it to you. There are seven mathematically precise events needed to capture these moons. Seven different things have to happen. If it comes into, uh, you know, what happens when the space shuttle came into the atmosphere at the wrong angle, it would bounce off like a rock on water and end up in the sun. And all of these things are mathematical equations. When you run the math, this capture theory won't work. And I have nine of them there. And that's a, a summary of it there. So write me and I'll give you the whole summary. Jupiter and its bad moons. Okay, I'm just going to give you a couple examples here. Jupiter anomalies. Now, I have ten anomalies. I'm just going to give you two of them because we're going to run out of time. And, uh, I want to emphasize on Pluto. So, Jupiter has 16 moons so far. <laughs> they keep finding moon more, you know. Uh, you notice there's Io, Europa, let's bring that up, uh, uh, Ganymede and Callisto. Those are the, the Galileo 4 that Galileo saw with his telescope. And they fit the ecliptic pretty good, you know. But here are these ones uh, off the ecliptic. Eight moons are too high above the ecliptic to fit nebular dust cloud story. Four have retrograde rotation. And then the, uh, there's one uh, around, I think it's around uh, Neptune or Uranus, uh, that not only is retrograde re rotation, but it's re uh, retrograde orbit, just like um, the ones around Pluto. And here's from a, a, a science book. They, they draw all these lines showing you know, that it's off the ecliptic, but they don't interpret, they don't have any interpretation for that. They just say, well, that they were captured there. You know, they didn't spin out of the dust cloud. Uh, Jupiter's anomalies number two. Jupiter has more anomalies. Moons are low to high density as they go outward, low here, high density here. If they spun out from this dust cloud, it should be just the opposite. The heavier ones would be here and the lighter ones out here. Now, that's Jupiter. Saturn has them just the opposite way. Heavy ones in close, the lighter ones out here. So you have the two total contrasts there. Again, I call it the fingerprint of God, that he put them in that position. And then they follow Newton's laws and everything, the law of angular momentum and Newton's three laws of motion. Number seven, the undiscovered country has very few craters. Scientists studying the craters in geology on Pluto and Charon, Charon found fewer small craters than they expected. Remember, expected means it doesn't fit the evolutionary presuppositions or assumptions. One of the regions the team examined was the smooth, geologically stable, geologically stable Vulcan Planitia on Charon, shown here. And you can see there aren't very many, very many here. One of the moons, uh, one of the four Galileo moons has the most cratering in the whole solar system. It's literally holes everywhere. And this one has very few. Other areas feature a young looking surface with no record of crater bombardment. This, I'm quoting them, a young looking, they keep using this word young. And I keep saying, but your theory says it's 4.5 billion years old. It can't be young. Bombardment, which was expected. These features are very, very young. Pluto is active today. That's the headline, says planetary scientist Dan Durda. Durda. 
Mission scientists are intrigued by the sparse distribution of red material here. It's just in some of these areas here, and then it's, it's petering out here. It's, it's very little of it here in this image, and wondered why it is not more widespread. And they don't have an answer to that. Also perplexing is that there is only one identified impact crater on the right Munz itself. This is the heart shape is called the right Munz. Munz is, moon, uh, uh, is Latin for like a sea or a dark area. Telling scientists that the surface, as well as some of the crust underneath, was created relatively recently. Again, I'm quoting, this is just from their papers. This in turn may indicate that Wright Munz was volcanically active late in Pluto's history. There's that young Pluto again. Number eight, the undiscovery country has aliens. We found aliens. Let's look closer at this area right here. Now watch as we come in. We'll go back. See there? Now we come in close. And there he is. Eyes, mouth. Nobody's pointed this out, but we're going to show you one other alien. This is it, again, backed out, two miles high. I'm surprised the UF people have not pointed this out. But, well, they have. A close up of this area proves life is there. I saw this picture. And I wonder, what is that? And they don't explain it in the, the scientific data, but somebody caught it. A little bit more searching, and here it is, a Pluto slug or snail. This is the artist's drawing of it. See, so they, they, they figured it looks like this based on these two pictures here. So we've got aliens. So here's the ones that we found on the internet. They live. Such imagination, right? So, the undiscovered country has no life. Pluto, now here's more news. Pluto may have water, according to a new study, which could massively boost the chances of finding alien life within our solar system. It's like, good grief. <laughs> First, we must define their definition of life. What did they say? Who remembers now, what did they say earlier might indicate, yeah, methane. Oh, there might be life there then because there's methane. Carbon molecules or water. They, they claim that this will prove that there's going to be life there. The Rosetta was a space probe built by the European Space Agency, launched 2004, and it reached after 12 years on September 2016, the Rosetta Comet Probe 67P. This is the the Rosetta Comet here. And this is comparing it to the city of Los Angeles. There's the city down there. Pretty good size. Now, they sent a probe to land on there. It crashed. For a while, it didn't work. They finally got some signals back. And it, they finally found it right in here. And there's their photograph of it. And it sent some info back, information back. On the comet, they found one organic carbon molecule. It's called glycine, and that's its uh, scientific uh, right up there. From National Geographic website, 2014-2015, Rosetta spotted phosphorus and organic compounds such as glycine. They only spotted one. The simplest amino acid in the haze around the comet. This discovery suggests that comets could have helped bring life to Earth by seeding our planet with the necessary raw materials. Yeah, one little glycine molecule. A few molecules of carbon does not make life. Let's look at the up close. Here is the 20 amino acids that make up every living thing, humans, animals, and plants. There's only 20, okay? And here's glycine up here in the corner. That's the one they found. Do we have life yet? Hardly. What is the chance of finding these 20 amino acids in the right order to create life? You've got to have all of these, and not just in a, in a, you know, in a mud ball or in the ocean. 
They have to be in the right order. That is the key. So, of 20 amino acids in another are another undiscovered country. How easy, how easy is it for amino acids to, quote, come together? The key word is order, order, order. Finding the right order in 20 amino acids. How many words can you make from your name? So example, write down, if you have a paper and pencil, take your name and write, uh, we'll show you an example here. Here's an example. Paul has four letters. Okay? So we can make le Paul, ou pa, ou pa. Okay? How many combinations are there for 20 letters or 20 amino acids? First, let's take Paul, and it's called a exponential equation. We multiply 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, we can have 24 possible combinations. Now let's just add a fifth one. Jacob, five letters. Bajako, Abjak, Kobja. You could use this to, if, you have, if you're going to have a dozen kids, see, you could just have these <laughs> arbitrary names, you know, come up, you know. <laughs> and the people will say, why are your names so funny? Hey, we're an exponential equation. <laughs> now, with that, with four, five combinations, we jump to 120 possible combinations. Now, are you thinking 20? Let's what, what happens when we take 20? That's what we would multiply it out to be. And that'll give us 24 trillion, 329 billion possible combinations. And only one will create life. So that's how many possible combinations and only one would create life. Now, let me go to this. God upholds all by his word, and, be, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. I call him, he is the orderer for the right order. Because it can, the amino acids can only be in the right order if you just have dead stuff. And see, when uh, Mr. Miller uh, found, he found one amino acid, he never said, that he found right-handed uh, right and left-handed amino acids, which some of you know cancel out each other. But they never reported that in the news. They said, he found an amino acid. This proves that life could come from the oceans. And it's what they don't tell you, the undiscovered country, that is what we need to know. So we have God creating the DNA blueprint, then atoms, and then molecules collect, connect it and call amino acids, 20 amino acids. <laughs> Then we have to have those acid formed chains of sometimes 100 amino acids together. Then those form proteins, and then they start to form organelles, which are little, you know, little bodies in our cell. Then we finally have a one-celled object, but it, if you take you know, the skin off your body, it's made up of cells, and you drop it on the floor, it's dead. Okay? So, uh, these cells can't live outside the body. So even though we have cells now, we have to put those cells to form tissues, cell groups. Those organs and, uh, have to form the, the basic organs on our body, and we finally have a human body. But all these steps, when I ran the, the number of things that have to happen, we're looking at not 24 trillion things, we're looking at 100 billion trillion, trillion accidents that have to come together to form a human body. Finding one out of 20 amino acids here <laughs> does not indicate life here, even if it's one cell. The undiscovered country of 4,000 planets. They claim they have found 4,000 exoplanets outside our solar system. I am very skeptical about this. It doesn't bother me. God could have created other planets. But what they call a planet doesn't necessarily, I'm just showing you pictures of all their, the stuff they put out there. The rule of thumb, planets aren't, here's a planet here that they, they through spectral analysis, uh, they claim proves that there might be life there. Light spectrum based on an artist's bias. 
the undiscovered country of 4,000 planets, none have life. None have ever been seen. All that you see in the news in that, all these back here, are our artist's drawings. All artist concepts based on spectral analysis. All artist's conceptions based on the light spectrum. Here's Sir Isaac Newton who developed this. Light coming in and then a prism breaks it up here. So here's the light reflected from the planet towards Earth and then they analyze the spectrum. They've never had a picture of a planet like you see in the books. This is what it looks like when it comes back. All these little spots and things and then they have to interpret that. Are they interpreted from a creationist standpoint or an evolutionary standpoint? Well, evolution, of course. What the experts say, and this is some of the light spectrums of a lot of these planets right here. He says the light spectrum analysis, this is what the scientists say. Gibson and co-author put a lot of effort into trying to resolve the discrepancy and consider whether Earth's atmosphere might be contaminating the ground-based data or whether unknown systematic uncertainties might be affecting the Hubble data. Overall, they can only highlight the need for caution. Now, see, you don't get this in the New York Times. <laughs> we found one amino acid, that means that we're gonna find life. Uh, and we, we find, you know, from the light spectrum, oh, there might be water on this planet, or there might be uh, uh, something else that would indicate that, oh, there's gonna be life. Much of, a, of an astronomer's time is spent investigating whether one can trust the data one is working with. So the truth is there, but it never reaches the evening news. Major problems the evening news never mentions, it would not be sensational. But this man, is, at least he's saying, we don't really know, because the data could be totally corrupted. But that, again, doesn't make the evening news. Imagination of life on other planets. 1950, the desert Venus, as in this Mole Hunter painting, hot, dry, and uninhabitable. 1950, the case for going to Mars, they thought, uh, to Venus. They were gonna send a probe to this twin. They claim that Venus is very similar to the Earth uh, before they sent a probe there. Uh, and then they thought they might find life there. You know, the little green man syndrome. Another artist's view, Venus was the most hidden planet until the 60s. Venera 13 landed on Venus March 1st, 1982 to snap a first color picture of the planet from its surface. The Russians were able to get one there. The probe was able to send data on the temperature of Venus at 887 degrees Fahrenheit before it melted. <laughs> This is a computer-generated portion of the uh, region there shown in this three-dimensional uh, computer generation. A volcano is here on the right. And somehow they extrapolated this out from that probe. Rule of thumb, as with Venus, Mars, and Pluto, when we finally get to the planet claimed to have possible life, it is found to be just the opposite. It's dead. The undiscovered country, will life ever be found? Not likely, because the Bible says Christ died once uh, for the sins for all, the just and righteous, the innocent for the guilty, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I maintain if there are fallen creatures on other planets that God created, then we will need to go there with the gospel. Christ only said he will die once, He's not going to go there and die again. Because I've had people say, well, why wouldn't Christ go there and then, you know, sacrifice himself there? It, that's not what the Bible says. It says he died once and he's not going to die again. Example, now the closest star is Alpha Centauri, uh, planets A and B. Uh, I mean, uh, stars A and B. It's 4.3 light years away. At 18,000 miles per hour, the speed of the space shuttle it would take 152 million years to get there. Anyone want to sign up uh, uh, for a missionary to go to Alpha Centauri? We don't even know if there's a planet there. 
All right, so we're looking at a pretty impossible way to get the gospel to these other, quote, planets, if they really are planets. I, it, it won't change my view of the universe if they really are a planet like the Earth. I mean, God could have made other planets. But the idea that we're going to go there is pretty ridiculous. Conclusion. Is the universe guilty of secretly harboring, harboring life? Summary. And I found a whole article uh, written by a man listing 15 things besides water that you would have to have to maybe start getting life. Uh, and I just told you the 20 amino acids that we need. The chances that all 20 would combine to be in the right order is one chance in 24 trillion, just, just to get them into a chain. You know, but then you still got to get them in a chain and all these other things. Of the 4,000 planets, zero have the right order of hundreds of chemicals for life. Conclusion, there is a battle between design by the laws of science versus the random chance accident. Again, just using these four laws, there's, there's lots of other laws out there that I could put in that in mathematical uh, formulas that again, when we apply them to the evolutionary model and that it won't work, it won't produce life or by chance and random accident. Number one, what we have really found in the undiscovered country is that it could not be what it is without an intelligent designer putting it there. Now, once the planets are in position, they follow the laws of angular momentum and Newton's three laws of motion, law of gravity. But they couldn't get there without God putting it there. Once in place and running, it follows these, these laws. Now, two years ago, I did the talk on SETI using Drake's equation. That's it there, and uh, it's on the uh, uh, YouTube now. Uh, look up uh, the TC TCCSA uh, website, and you can download that. And I go through this whole formula, and I show uh, Drake's equation supposedly proved, and National Geographic said this a couple years ago, and it said, is there life out there? And Drake's equation proves that there is. And when I read that, I said, I don't think so. What I've been doing for the last, next year I've been teaching creation science and homeschool for 30 years. And I take the same articles that they have, and I'm teaching my kids in what I call my Pathfinder class, take the data, the data is good, it's scientific data. Their conclusion though is based on an evolutionary worldview, not a scientific one. Using his equation from 1961 with modern scientific discoveries, and I spend a whole hour on that video explaining this, the mathematical chance of life outside of Earth is zero. When you plug in what we know about the universe that Mr. Drake did not know, when we plug that into his formula, it proves zero chance of life in outer space. Conclusion. Their evolutionary view requires Pluto to get there by breaking all the laws of science, as well as 80 to 100 moons in the solar system that have been captured. Rule of thumb about undiscovered countries, all space objects. Um, I was asked earlier today, well, what is a planet? I think there's only one planet. That's the Earth. Everything else are satellites. They should have been called satellites because they cannot harbor life. And they are still fighting over whether Pluto's a planet or, or what. Uh, when they can't get there, they claim it will prove evolutionary theory. When they can get there, they have to revise their evolutionary theory and give up each object as a candidate for life, the little green man syndrome. In other words, evolution almost never predicts anything correctly. So this is the end of Pluto, the undiscovered country, but not the end of money being spent to prove evolutionary life on further and further space objects, the little green man syndrome. All right, I made it. One minute to spare. <laughs>
your book. Oh, there's my book, yeah. The old edition. Yeah. And so uh, for that, I thought maybe we could answer a question I've always had. Yep. And that's uh, if you send a space probe, a discovery, out among the planets and you get, seem to direct it to go into orbit around that planet mm -hmm. and then do it again in the Jupiter, Saturn, and all the way to Pluto, um, how in the world that little space probe is going to transmit data back to the Earth when all of these planets and everything is in the way. And how is, can you explain to me how that happens that we can communicate through that mm -hmm. and they can and it can send back, a machine can send back those signals, yeah. Millions and is it billions of miles? Yeah, yeah, billions, trillions of miles. The question then, then is, these satellites that we send out there, how do they get, you know, with all the stuff in between, planets, asteroids, and all this, how do they get the message back to us? And, it, and again, that is a difficulty. I know with the Pluto probe, uh, it's taking just the data uh, days and months that they, it started sending back once it got there. Uh, they said it would, some of it would be six months before they got it all and then years to analyze it. And so, yeah, that's a, a good question. There's a lot of stuff in between. Uh, I don't know uh, any, if anyone, yeah, do you know on that? Oh, okay, so that's what I would say. Yeah, all the debris in between though could slow it, at least slow the signal down. I mean, of course, we have radio signals that will go through these walls and we can listen to the radio here. So it is a radio signal that can go through things, although it couldn't go through a whole planet. But it might be creating superspeed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. A radio wave can go in all directions. Yeah. We can have a laser, but how do you, how do you point the laser where, where it will arrive? Right. Yeah. Do you, do you know the answer? I was going to say it's about four and a half hours to Pluto, the speed of light. Yeah, four and a half by the speed of light to Pluto. Oh, okay. So, uh, another thing that's very important here is that uh, you actually have a directed antenna. You've got a very broad receiving antenna. Yeah. And then there's a lot of error correction encoding in the signals to, to help correct the noise. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Probably a double beat song of error correction. Okay. Correction. Yeah. All right. Question back there. Yes. Real loud, please. For our, the our problem. yeah, the starlight problem, yeah. Can there's like explain to everyone in case people are not aware. Yeah, the starlight problem is if the universe, according to the evolutionary model, is 22 billion light years across, uh, and God created the Earth with light on it when He created Adam and Eve, how could if the universe is that big and we're seeing stars from the edge, how can that light, you know, if it takes 22 billion years to get here, then we shouldn't even be seeing light out there. My, my uh, theory, or my, what I feel good about, is that the Bible does say God stretched forth the heavens. I think that he created the light. He could create, I, I did a whole, let, there's seven different ways to explain it. Uh, he could create the stars and then take his fingers, so to symbolically, and stretch the light to the earth. That's the way I think he did it. He, he made it all with the light hitting us already. Because of course, Adam and Eve would need the sunlight as well too. Um, like I say, there's, there's other theories that, uh, there's called the Romanian, Romanian space equation. It's R Romanian mathematics. If you email, I'll send you the the, um, the, the printout of it, and it's a mathematical formula that when you run that one, the universe would only be seven to 10 light years across. So, but you never hear about that on the evening news either, because that would blow the evolution out of the water. 
So um, that's a, but that's an excellent question. So. Yeah, they, they're, they're saying it's inflating out. Yeah, the Big Bang Theory says it's getting bigger and bigger. And, they, and isn't the reason why they put it in inflation is because they have a distant starlight travel problem of their own? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the Big Bang, basically, because I kind of feel like that's like, if I had to take the strongest argument against the Young Earth, I would choose that one because we don't have a solid explanation on that, but it seems like their idea is basically they're kind of in the same boat with us, this best case scenario, because, yeah, we can't explain for sure right now, but neither can they. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, boils down to that. Okay. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I had heard many years ago that when we launched the Jupiter probe, that when the, the, the ships got out there, when they were sending their signals back, our computer couldn't read that because we had a damp in our computer to shut the capsule. Oh. How do they anticipate what computer is going to be needed by the time that planet gets shipped into there to really receive back that signal? Because those, those computers we have on Earth are not. Yeah, yeah. So how do they how yeah, they, they send it out, and it took you know four or five years to get there, and now uh, he's saying that can that that computer on board the probe communicate with the ones back here? I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, if anyone else, I, I know that uh, Bob Helvenstein worked on some of those problems. I think uh, the the problem. One interesting thing about when they dropped into to Jupiter, the probe, and the first information that came back, I got to see it. And again, they're saying the same thing about Pluto. Well, it isn't what we expected, which means it didn't fit the evolutionary model. But then, after they could massage the information, six months later, all this was proving that it, it evolved. <laughs> but the first, I try to get the first information back from Pluto before they have a chance to, to rework it so that it supports evolutionism. Then in front, there was another young man. So um, with the supposed life on Pluto, with the picture of the, did that just be our rover? Did it be a what? Did that just be our rover? Yeah, <laughs> on, on Mars? That's a good question. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, the 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 one on Pluto was something somebody uh, you know made up. I'm sure. But they, it, I saw that though in the first pictures coming back, that little black spot. I thought they're not addressing that. They don't say what it was. It's just supposed to be all uh, a flat, level plane. So they they still have an answer that I've been able to see what that blob of blackness was. So somebody made up the story about the slug. It's great fun. Yeah. How long could the core be hot? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. See, they said that means that the uh, the surface there could only be five hundred thousand years old. So that means that the uh, I I think when when I studied about the moon and they found that it had a hot core. They said, well, that means the moon could only be one or two million years old. But we know it isn't because we know the universe is, or the solar system, 4.5 billion years old. But they never explain why it's that way, other than that the theory calls for it to be that way. How, I don't know if they've done the calculation. How long, you said it was 4.5 million, which is cool. Actually, when would it actually be cool? 1.5 million? Oh, when would it actually cool off? Yeah. Yeah, that, that involved, that's involved in it too. I guess I don't have a, a direct answer that, well, that means the, 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 the creationists that I've read who wrote the book on the, on the moon after they brought this data back said that means the moon couldn't be more than one or two million years old. Now, I believe that when God created the earth and the moon, he had to create it mature because the earth is heated by a, a molten core too. Uh, you break down the uranium-238 in that. But, and so they say, well, the half-life of that means that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. No, it just means that God made it old to start with so that we could live on it. And uh, you were saying that the universe is not expanding the velocity of the Earth? Well, if you use this very obscure mathematical equation, 
Yeah, it's not expanding. Again, that's, they go back and forth on that too. Again, what gets on the evening news is all cleaned up and makes it look like it's all, everything is, everybody knows exactly what's happening. Well, they don't. Yeah, if you're going to use the laws of entropy, yeah, it's, it's it decaying. Um, Dr. Lucas, um, and he's spoken here, Dr. Lucas, uh, has written quite a lot about the, that gravity is decaying, and he can prove it with some of the galaxies, with the Earth, and other things. So I'd recommend his book on that, because uh, he's done a good scientific study of that. How many have heard Dr. Lucas when he's been here? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he, he's really hit that well. Yeah. Yeah, the blue, yeah, the red shift. I'm sorry, red, red shift, yep, yep. So he's wrong. Yeah. And he is wrong. There's seven explanations for red shift. The only one you hear about is that it proves the Earth, the universe is expanding. I've written a whole program on that, taking every, all seven of them and showing how they explain it better than the red shift idea. And if you're interested, again, uh, uh, email me and I'll send you the 50 or 60 page PowerPoint I have on that. I can send it in a PDF file. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, seeing red. Uh, ARP spoke. Yeah, ARP, ARP is the expert on that. Seeing red. Uh, Halton, Halton ARP. Yeah. A, is it A R R P? I'm not sure if it's two. A R P. Yeah. He, he's an evolutionist and he discovered this red shift and has a whole different explanation for it uh, that is very scientific because he studied irregular uh, quasars, wasn't it? Yeah. And when he, when he published this, they threw him out of the country. They, they wouldn't publish it in the United States. He finally got a book published in Canada. They fired him from the different schools he was a teacher and professor at, and he ended up in the Max Planck laboratories in Germany they're a little more open-minded over there. <laughs> but his, his discovery is phenomenal. And it proves that red shifts have nothing to do with an expanding universe. Thanks. Yeah, that, I've forgotten about that. Any other questions? Yeah. So Dr. Ross Carter was here a couple weeks ago. And he said that we do not know, and it was a little bit of what he's talking afterwards, that we don't know the speed of light. Uh, well, like, what doctor was it? Dr. Rob Carter. Rob Carter. Okay, I haven't read him. I know that um, the, and see, and, and, and I think ARP goes into that in Red Shift again. Uh, the, some scientists, I forget who they are, if you guys remember, uh, has written a book about that, that the speed of light is decaying, which would follow the laws of entropy in, in thermodynamics. And, and that it's, it's getting slower based on measurements 100 or 200 years ago. Again, it's more controversial because if it's, if it's slowing down, that's going to blow a lot of evolutionary theories out of the water. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, do we really know that the average is correct? Yeah. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, okay. So we, we can't really get an accurate measure of it, but yeah. That's one of the things Dr. Jason Lyle talks about. We do not know the one way velocity of light, only the average of a round trip. Okay, yeah. That's what he's said. Okay, yeah. So we don't, it seems to be, again, an unknown, but we don't really get that in the evening news again. Yes? No, I haven't heard of that. The, the Vatican has the most powerful telescope. Hmm. Hadn't heard of it. Yeah. Well, 
Well, stay tuned for further developments. I'd like to hear what they find out. Yeah. Any other questions? Did you have a, an answer? No. Oh, okay. You have a question. <laughs> yes. Okay, go for it. Well, I was wondering if in our country, it seems, of course, the theory of evolution is a religious doctrine. Yeah. And you can't de defy can't it. question it. Yeah. But other countries, there's more open mindedness, like you yeah. said. Yeah. Are we getting scientists in other countries to recognize the truth now and coming forth with new theories and saying that, you know, really, this world, this world, this universe is not, the evidence for it being old, is, yeah. the evidence for life elsewhere is not there. Right. Yeah, other countries, um, the, there was a Chinese man who said, in our country, this is like 20 years ago under Mao Zedong, but uh, he said, you know, in our country, we cannot criticize the government, uh, but we can criticize Einstein and Darwin. He says, in your country, you can criticize the government all day, but you cannot criticize or uh, Einstein and Darwin. <laughs> and so uh, it was interesting when I taught at Fremont at the Chinese church there, my contact lady said, Russ, because I'd been there 10 years earlier to another Chinese church, and I criticized Darwin and Einstein. And who had, had my book there? Did you have it? Yeah. And in there, I have a whole chapter on Einstein was wrong. And it's not me. It's, it's what scientists have said about him. But again, that's never on the evening news. But anyway, this church never asked me back. Because in the Chinese culture, you do not criticize the professor. So when I taught at this other Chinese church, my friend Ying Ling said, Russ, whatever you do, don't criticize Einstein or Darwin. So I just tried to emphasize, you know, how the geology is left over that we see that she wanted me to hit on geology is left over from Noah's flood. I talked a little bit about dinosaurs uh, and some that might be living today. I, she said, just say they might be living today <laughs> because that blows the whole evolutionary model out of the water because they supposedly died 65 million years ago. So, but I went through and they were very happy with what I did and everything. So I, and, and, it, and they're Christians, but they're these engineers that they've heard the evolutionary message for the last 30 or 40 years, you know, and, and you just don't question those things in, in the Chinese culture. But I did write to the man in Taiwan, we're hoping to go there in February, the missionary there, and I told him this problem I had. He says, no, no, the people here are very creation minded. They do not you know, buy this whole evolutionary thing. Yeah. There's a lot of scientists now that they're retiring and no longer need grants from the, that they are coming out and saying they need. Yeah, grant money flows to those who are politically correct. He, he was saying that there's a lot of scientists retiring and now they don't need grant money and so they're, they're saying this might not be right after all. So that's encouraging that they, uh, you know, you have to follow the money. <laughs> Yeah. If you could give, strictly speaking from an astronomy standpoint, if you could give like one piece of evidence which you would say is the strongest one for a young universe, what would it be from, this, from an astronomy standpoint? I would say the polonium halo from the breakdown of uranium-238 uh, is it's called God's Little Mystery. Who, do you remember who wrote that? Gentry. Yeah, Gentry. That to me is the most scientific evidence that the Earth's crust was made in three minutes or less. Because this polonium halo that's, that's given off by the breakdown of uranium-238 will only last three minutes and then it's gone. And the granite crust has these polonium halos in it, which mean that crust had to cool in less than three minutes or there would be no polonium halos. And that would, again, that would, you know, we'd have to go to other planets or, you know, other satellites to find and dig that up and test it. Uh, but that, to me, is the most scientific evidence to show the Earth was made in less than three minutes. And that would mean, you know, we can extrapolate that out to the whole solar system. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. To that question that was discussed earlier about the starlight problem. Yeah. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah, Starlight and Time, but I thought it was actually the explanation. His model was pretty good. 
And remind me what that was. Do you remember? Yeah, the universe was expanding. Yeah, it's like a white hole opposite of a black hole. Yeah. The problem is I don't buy black holes and these things. A lot of these things and wormholes and all that, it makes great scientific stories and movies, but the evidence, uh, it, it's used to prop up the Big Bang Theory. And there's all kinds of things out there they claim are there, like I showed you that Scientific American magazine at the beginning, that it's all smoke and mirrors, really, and that this new model of the atom can answer all those questions if they would look at it. It gives a, you know, it boils everything down in the universe to two forms, uh, two basic elements. There's wave energy, and when that, when God takes those waves in the universe and forms them into these spinning rings of energy in the atom, then we have matter. So there's only two forms of energy. There's wave energy, and then matter with energy spinning in it to create uh, the atoms that we have. And they're held together by electrical and magnetic rules of science. Ampere's law and Coulomb's law are the best laws to explain this model of the atom. Whereas you get into the quantum theory and Einstein theory, there's the weak force and strong force, and you ask them, well, what is this? And they said, that's, that's just what it is, it's there. If you look at my book, I give a list, a, a two-page list of, we start with these spinning rings of energy, and then we progress on up to where we have you and me, and how God made the spinning rings, took the light waves, and turned them into these spinning rings that now are magnetic, and hold the atom together using electrical and magnetic forces. And it all can be proven mathematically. And then uh, about five or six years ago, Bergman and Lucas finally, when I, I they looked at my book and everything, and and, uh, and they said this is this is 99% what we're trying to say, but it was in everyday language. <laughs> and so uh, they have done tremendous work on it, but they can't, you know, uh, it, again the letters in their newsletter all from Europe, who was asking about. They're very open to these new things. But here, if it isn't Einstein and if it isn't Darwin, we don't want to hear about it. We're not going to talk about it. And they're just cutting out half of the science that's out there. And several of the people that are evolutionists, like Arp and, uh, and Gentry was, was a Christian, but when he published his book, another scientist in Europe said, well, what you found would indicate that the Earth is very young. And this got back to, I think he worked for the, didn't he work for the atomic energy um, uh, government place and they fired him. Because his discovery was politically incorrect, even though it was real science. So you run into that. Uh, ARP, also the, uh, about Redshift, there was a, a woman astronomer who was head of the astronomy society, I think it was, if you remember, I haven't read the book for a long time, and she, agreed with ARP that his conclusions were that the red shift wasn't, you know, the universe wasn't expanding. She got fired. Because <laughs> you think, well, they have tenure and everything, they can't fire you, they'll get you out. <laughs> In the Oort cloud, yeah, <laughs> that's maybe where they are. We hadn't gone that far. The Oort cloud, again, is made up to try to support the idea of the Big Bang story. And there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that's made up simply to support that story. And I call it a story when I teach in my classes. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And we somehow can measure that. Yeah. Uh, it said eventually if you go back far enough, the sun was actually touching the earth. Right. So if, the question is how, can we, how are they coming up with this measurement? Right. I went to the uh, Black Hills and taught at a church there, and I told them, talked about the neutrinos. The neutrinos supposedly prove that the sun is powered by atomic energy, it's a byproduct, you know, like smoke off a of fire. And uh, one of the men, and I says, there's evidence that neutrinos don't even exist. 
And he's, one man was uh, the administrator or the uh, security man at the neutrino tank that's 3,000 feet under the ground there in the Black Hills. He said, I'll take you down. I said, wow. <laughs> so we went down 3,000 feet. I've got four minutes. Uh, they have a tank of 100,000 gallons of cleaning fluid that's supposed to capture the neutrinos to prove that the sun is powered by atomic energy. And I talked to the scientist. I had studied this before, and, and he didn't know we were creationists or anything. We just played dumb. Uh, and I'd ask dumb questions, you know. Uh, they, when they first put it to work, they found supposedly three neutrinos. In Time Life, I think it was, or, or maybe it was Scientific American, showed a hand on the front, or it was Discover Magazine, that said a hand on the front that says, three million, when you put your hand out, three million neutrinos just went through your hand. Because that's what's coming from the sun. But when they tried to run the information, when they ran the tank, they got about three or four neutrinos. So they went back and recalibrated everything. And of course, this is our tax money at work. <laughs> Millions of dollars. They had to bring this tank down through a, a, an elevator that's about uh, 20 by 20 by 20 feet. You know, so they had to bring it all down in little pieces and weld it all together in this cavern. So I asked the dumb question. I says, well, and, and they still haven't found enough neutrinos to prove that it, there's millions going through my hand right at this second. And I asked the professor, uh, the man in charge there, I says, well, what about the, you know, if we're not finding enough neutrinos, couldn't it indicate that the, the, the sun is not powered by atomic energy? What about the, the contraction theory, which is that as the, as the sun shrinks, it creates heat and sunlight and everything we get. It's just like if you, if you hammer a nail into to a board, you touch the top, it gets hot because it's contracting, it's pressing it down. He says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, that, it can't be that because that would mean the sun is only a couple million years old. And we know, and we know it's 4.5 billion years old. Because that's, you know, then atomic energy would last that long. So they throw that, and there's evidence, and your question about how do they know, one article I read said that the sun's circumference is shrinking by about six to 10 feet a year. Now, how they figure that out, I don't know. But that means that it's getting smaller, like you said, because it's contracting to create the heat that we have. So there's more evidence for the contraction theory than the, the neutrinos in that, but that doesn't fit 4.5 billion years. So they throw that out. All right, one question a more, and we're done. I'll stay afterwards, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Isaac Isamoff, science fiction writer and an atheist, said the most embarrassing thing he ever wrote. And he wrote, he was trying to write one book for every age, you know, his age, you know, 40 or 50, 60 books. And, and I used to read his science fiction stories and I liked them, but he was an atheist. And he said the most embarrassing thing he predicted was that there would be 40 feet of dust on the moon. Yeah, they thought, and see, uh, Bob Halfenstein, Alan's father, worked on that, and... Bill Overton. Yeah, Bill, yeah. Overton. Bill Overton worked on that, and that was a big concern. And that's why the first one that landed had giant pizza bit dishes on its feet, so if it landed on, like, you know, what happens when you drop a marble into flour? <laughs> right down to the bottom. And that's what they were afraid would happen. And then when they got there, and you, I've got a footprint, you know, a picture of the footprint, the dust was about this thick. When you run the figure based on how much meteoritic dust hits the Earth, then the moon is only, you know, 10 to 50,000 years old based on the dust on it. So that, uh, again, is, is proof that the moon is young and the Earth is young. All right, we're going to, where's the boss? <laughs>